Hi, this is 14.4 Gradient and Directional Derivatives. In here, we'll try to give you the formulas, and we're going to work with the formulas, give you a little bit of concept, uh, but there's just too much to go through, so I'm not going to do too much of that. But what we want to do is to get you working with these and then talk about the concepts. So a gradient here has a new symbol for us, and it's this upside down delta. The gradient of f means that we're going to take the partial with respect to x and multiply it by the vector i, and then the partial with respect to y and multiply it by the vector j. So the gradient, what it ends up being is the path that has the biggest change from a certain point. And so if you're on top of a hill, if you went different ways, you would be looking at the steepest part going down the hill. That would be the direction of the gradient. That's what it is in a nutshell. Okay, example one. We want to look at the temperature at some point xy on a metal plate given by this formula, and that would be in degrees Celsius, where both x and y are measured in centimeters. Okay, so this would be the level curves of our graph, and then this would be just the graph of T, what's going on there with uh, the temperatures. So part A says calculate gradient T and use your formula to fill in the table. Then sketch your vectors on the diagram. So if we have the gradient T, I defined it here, we need the partials in order to work with this. So let's find these. Partial with respect to X is equal to negative X over 2 and the partial with respect to Y is negative Y over 2. Given that, you should be able to do that. Now we want to plug in each one of these points and figure out what the gradient is. Well, let's write the gradient first. I should do that. So our gradient then is going to be at our point AB is equal to the partial with respect to x, which is negative x over 2, and that would be in the i direction, and then the partial with respect to y, and that would be negative. And then you just tag on the i's and the j's. That's going to be our vector. So note that the gradient is a vector, and we have the tags with the i and j. So now the gradient of t at the point, let's do negative 1, 0. If I plug that in over here, that's going to give me 1 half i plus 0 j. So I'm going to put the 1 half in there. Calculate the rest of those, and then stop this, and then check my answers. So voila, so at the point negative 2, 0, I get i, 1, 1, I get negative 1 half i plus j, in parentheses, the quantity of that, and then at 0 square root of 2, I get negative square root of 2 over 2, and this way I get positive square root of 2 over 2, j, forgot the j there. And then I found the magnitude of each one of these to figure out how long they're going to be. So this one is in the x direction, and it's going to have a magnitude of 1 half. So I go to the point negative 1, 0, and I'm going to do a magnitude of 1 half in the i direction. So that would be that vector right there. At negative 2, 0, it's going to be in the direction of i, and it's going to have a magnitude of 1. So I start here at negative 2, 0, and I'm going to go in that direction with a magnitude of 1. At the point 1, 1, which is my point P here, it's going to have a magnitude of square root of 2 over 2, so it's going to go like that. And then uh, I'll finish the last two as well. Okay, so we got a couple observations here. I put them in notes right here. So the gradient is in the direction of the greatest increase. So from P here, are we going up or down when we go in this direction? It looks like we're going up. And in fact, on here, yes, we're going to go up. And then it also is perpendicular to the contour line. So at P, if I take a line that's perpendicular to the tangent there, that is where the gradient vector is going to be. And when the gradients are close together, right here, when, I'm sorry, when the contour lines are close together, this gradient is going to be longer than if we have contour lines that are more spread out. That one's a little bit shorter. So we, we have less change going up the hill here as when we're down here, right? So that's kind of the gradient. The gradient goes to the greatest change. 
the direction of the greatest change, and that's what we're trying to look for. And when I say greatest change, I mean from a point, a designated point. Now in this part B, it says approximate how fast does the temperature change at point P. So this is actually point P up here. As you move toward the point Q, so it's going to be all along this line here. So as we move along that line, we want to find and estimate the rate of change. So what we're going to do is we're going to find the rate of change of T. And we want to do it in that direction. So this is the approximate, approximation of my change in F all over the length of my PQ. And so this is going to be equal to, if I go ahead and find my different values. So plugging in 1, 1 and plugging in the other point, I get those values. So if I do this now, I plug in these values, 0.5 and 0 0.25, it's actually two point, uh, 0.2486. When I find those two different values and then I take the difference from P to Q, or Q minus P I should say, and then I do the, um, find the magnitude of that, I'm gonna get negative 0.3 degrees Celsius per centimeter. So that's, what I, uh, that's how I'm changing here. So as I slide down here, for each centimeter that I slide, I'm gonna drop 0.3 degrees Celsius. That's the idea. And so that would be an estimate of my rate of change. Okay, so now we're going to do a directional derivative of f at a, b in the direction of a unit vector u. So if it's not unitized, go ahead and unitize it. But if we have some vector u, we can define a directional derivative. So before what we did was we either went in the x direction or we went in the y direction. Now we might want to go in the whatever direction. So we do break it down by its components a little bit and we look at those components to help us figure it out. But now we want to look at a rate of change that's not in the x or y direction, some different direction. So then that is what this directional derivative does do for us. So it's the derivative in the direction of u and we plug in some point a b and then we have our definition of derivative there so we're changing a little bit on the a and we're changing a little bit on the b and then these would be how much relative to the components of u that we are changing now what does that become or what does that turn into well the directional derivative is equal to my partial in x times the component the x component of u, and then the partial in y times the y component of u, which we recognize as the dot product, and this part and this part come from the gradient. Remember we had i and j just a minute ago, so that would just be the gradient dotted with u. So that's the dot product. So when we find a directional derivative, this is one way that we can go ahead and do it. Now, Let's look at directional derivatives and see what they mean a little bit. So, for example, we want each of these different functions below decide whether the directional derivative indicated is positive, negative, or zero. Remember, we're just looking for a rate of change. Are we changing positively, negatively, or zero? In the direction of a particular vector, one is i plus 2j and the other one is 2i two, two plus j. So when I look at this one here, this is a contour line and we're on the contour line of four. And so one of them is this V direction right here. Well, does my value for that contour, or am I still on the same contour? What's going on? I'm still at four. So at this one, so my directional derivative for V, vector V is going to be zero, because I'm not changing at all. If I do the same directional derivative, but I do it on W at this point, what's happening now? Well, I go from 4 to 5. Does that mean I'm increasing or decreasing when I travel along this vector w? Well, it means I'm increasing, so it's going to be positive. Okay, go ahead and try these two, g and h, and see if you can determine should v and w be positive, negative, or zero. Okay, so check here. This one right here is going from 6 to 5, so then that would be a negative. This one is going from 6 to 7, so we're going to have positive for the w directional um, derivative that we're doing. 
This one, both V and W are kind of going the same. They're both going from 10 down to 9. So both of them would be a rate of change that would be negative. So that's directional derivatives with contour lines. Which direction are you going into? I'm not going X and Y anymore. I'm going different directions with that. Okay, let's summarize some things now. So we've talked about the gradient. The gradient is, uh, the direction of the gradient is perpendicular to the contour of F through some point AB in the direction of the maximum rate of increase of F. And so when that happens, that is perpendicular to the contour of F through AB. Then the magnitude of the gradient is the maximum rate of change of F at that point. Large when the contour lines are close together and small when they are far apart. And so if I look right here, these contour lines are pretty close together. And so when that happens, this vector gradient is going to be much greater than this one right here because this contour line is further away from this one here. So you're going down the hill slower. And notice that you are perpendicular to these contour lines from wherever we are. Okay, so it might be counterintuitive why this one's a little bit shorter, but just think about, okay, if I'm going downhill, this is a little bit flatter, so then my rate of change, this one right here is a little bit flatter, so it's a little bit shorter, okay? This one is a little bit longer because my rate of change is going to be greater because the contour lines are tighter together. Okay, let's get into some cranking now. So this one, it says calculate the gradient of f of x given this function at the point 1, 2. So we go ahead and find the gradient, which is a vector. So I need to find my two partials in x and y. So I just take 5 and put it over whatever is the object of the, uh, the ln function and then chain off with the variable that I do want there. So I got those two partials. So now we'll write the gradient for this. So now I've written my gradient. Now all I need to do is plug in my point 1, 2. When I do that, I get a 2 and I get a 4. Double check me on that. I hope I did the arithmetic right. Okay, so then that would be my gradient at this point. And so this would be the direction where I would find the most change would be in the uh, 2i plus 4j direction of that vector. Now, for example, 4, we want to take exactly the same problem, but now we want to find the direction derivatives in the direction of each one of these vectors, respectively. Okay, so what I did was I took this vector right here and I unitized it. So I get that one there. Unitized this one, the V, I, called it, I just called it V. This one I called it W. Okay, so I unitized each one of those. So if I want to find now the directional derivative in the direction of U from the point 1, 2, I take the gradient of F and I dot it with my new u. So um, I know my gradient from up above is going to be 2 plus 4j. So I take that and I dot it and I'm going to get negative square root of 2 which is about negative 1.414. Go ahead and do the same thing for your v and your w. Pause this, try it, and I'll come back with the answers. So when I calculated each one of these I ended up with negative square root of 2, 4.365 and 4.43 can't read it there. 8 it would be 4.438. Okay, so finally, what does all this mean? Well, if I take the magnitude of my gradient of f, I'm going to get 4.472. Notice that it's pretty close to this. I purposely looked at 2i plus 4j, and I made two vectors that were pretty similar or pretty close in nature to these. What happened when I found the directional derivative of both of those? Well, they were very close to my gradient magnitude. Now look at this one. This one is way different. It's in a totally different direction, everything else. How close is this one, 1 1.414, to, or negative 1.414, to this 4.472? Not very close at all. So the purpose of this is to say, okay, this one right here, you're never going to find a directional derivative that's bigger than this value right here because that is the maximum that you do have. If you stand on a hillside and you spin around, say, for instance, that this is my gradient. And if I spin around and go in any other direction, 
as I get closer to this gradient, I'm going to be closer in magnitude to the magnitude of that gradient. And so that's kind of what it's saying. Now, with this, actually, I get in the opposite way. I can get in the opposite way this way, too, uh, with my magnitude, if you do that. But this is kind of the idea of what's happening. So remember that the gradient will go to the direction of the maximum change. And our directional derivatives will just work off of that gradient, spinning around uh, some angle measurement in order to calculate what that directional derivative is. Okay, I think this gives you some idea. This is kind of long. I apologize. But I hope you enjoyed this. And thanks for listening. And you have a great day.